There's so much optimism in Victoria now with the number of new detections of coronavirus declining, but there's a stark reminder this morning of just how lethal this disease is with another terrible death toll over the past 24 hours. Reporter Stephanie Ferrier joins us now from Melbourne. Steph, very sad news. Yes, hi Joe. very sad news indeed with another 24 deaths recorded. And this is almost Victoria's deadly day. We had 25 deaths just nine days ago. But this now raises our state's death toll here to 462. So incredibly sad news for many families out there that are dealing with this grief and this horrific uh, consequence of this pandemic. However, as you say, there is a little bit of hope for Victorians here who are still enduring the tough stage four lockdowns in Melbourne and stage three restrictions in regional Victoria. With the case numbers only increasing by one in the past 24 hours, so they're now up to 149. But importantly, the seven day trajectory is still on the downward path, which is great news. We now uh, have a seven day average of 175. That's down from 195 yesterday. And that compares with 279 just a week prior to this. So it gives you some indication of the fact that we are going well in terms of really getting on top of this second wave. And of course, this also comes on Wednesday, which traditionally has been seen by health officials as a bit of a spike day and that's because of the fact that often the laboratories are closed over the weekend there's a bit of batching and a bit of catch-up so we did actually hear from Professor Brett Sutton when it was in the 200s uh, last week and he was saying that he'd take that as a good sign on a Wednesday so 149 I guess is a very optimistic sign for us. Now Steph there's an inquiry into what went wrong with the hotel quarantine system there in Victoria it's been taking evidence for more than a week now who will be at that hearing today? Yes, yeah, so th this morning we're going to be hearing this parliamentary uh, probe into the government's handling of COVID-19 and that's different of course from the independent inquiry set up by the government that is before the former judge Jennifer Coate. Now we are hearing from the emergency commissioner Andrew Crisp and he is seen as a bit of a key or fig pivotal figure in this whole uh, hotel inquiry situation because he chaired an emergency meeting in late March where it was decided to use private security guards at hotel quarantine. Now earlier on he did issue a statement saying and confirming that the Australian Defence Force was involved in initial planning of the scheme but he said that he did not seek nor did representatives of the ADF offer assistance as part of that hotel quarantine program and he said that subsequent communications uh, did with the ADF didn't relate to uh, ADF assistance at all. Now the ABC understands that there were actually about 100 ADF personnel that were on standby to be deployed uh, to Victoria to help in the hotel quarantine system, but obviously weren't. And of course, this comes after the war of words between the Premier, Daniel Andrews, who says that it's not the case that he was offered hundreds of ADF personnel and rejected them, and the Defence Minister, Linda Reynolds, who says that that offer was made and was taken up by other people and other states uh, uh, that did use some of the ADF uh, troops and personnel. So there is a little bit of a disconnect and we're obviously going to hear whether or not there's any further light that's shed there. Before that, we're also expected to hear from the police minister, Lisa Neville, and there might be some questions about potential police involvement or why they weren't used, as well as Jill Hennessy, the attorney general. And she might be asked questions in terms of the state of emergency extension. Of course, we did hear that the government is unlikely to get their 12 month extension through when that state of emergency expires in a couple of weeks and they're probably going to have to come up with a compromised shorter extension timeline. And Steph, for people outside Victoria, explain what the situation's been with education over the past several weeks and what's likely to happen with education in the coming months. It's been very, very long, Joe. speaking as a parent of three primary school kids. Most of, uh, a lot of the uh, term two and just about all of term three has been learning from home. And that is to try to really get on top of these COVID numbers in this second wave here. But we did hear more hope for a lot of the kids and parents out there. Yesterday, the Chief Health Officer, Professor Brett Sutton, did say that he really hoped that kids would be going back to face-to-face -face learning in class 
classrooms in term four. Now we're not quite sure exactly when that will be but he said that it would probably have to be staggered and before that James Molino, the state's education minister, uh, also said that that was, he was really confident that that was going to happen given the tracking of the numbers and he did promise that any decision would probably be made before we see school holidays start in about three weeks time. OK, we'll leave it there. Steph Ferrier reporting from Melbourne. Now turning to the revised rules for communities along the Victorian border, it's a welcome relief for people in cities like Mildura, which is enduring restrictions from the west and north of the town. Reporter Alex Trelaw joins us now from Mildura. Alex, g'day. So what did the restrictions stop people from doing? Good morning, Joe. Yes, welcome relief is correct here for our cross-border residents uh, in Mildura. We're between the New South Wales and South Australian border, so we've been hit with uh, two sets of border restrictions, both uh, quite different in what people are allowed to do. Essentially, what there wasn't much uh, that border residents have been able to do recently. Uh, first of all, in New South Wales, uh, the border has been tightened um, with residents in Victoria only able to cross into New South Wales um, 2.5 kilometres is, is the radius that they're only allowed to uh, travel in for work and essential services. Further down in Murrayville uh, on the South Australian border, uh, only farmers with property on both sides of the border were allowed to enter and year 11 and 12 students. Um, so people that needed to cross over to uh, their service towns in South Australia like Pinaroo um, that has their petrol stations, their groceries, medical appointments, they weren't able to do. Uh, but now like we've heard yesterday, the New South Wales government has uh, has decided to reinstate the 50 kilometre radius for uh, cross-border residents and the South Australian government also announced yesterday that the uh, radius that was uh, previously in effect, that was a 40 kilometre radius, will now be uh, put back in place Friday midnight. Now we don't know exactly what time or when uh, the New South Wales restrictions will be lifted. Uh, the government has uh, said that it, it, we can expect that in about 10 days but what that will look like who will be able to cross and apply for border permits uh, uh, is still yet to be known Joe. And Alex yeah how frustrating has that been for locals there and what kind of challenges have there been? Yeah, there's been challenges right across in virtually every sector, Joe. Uh, we're, we're right in the middle of a uh, citrus harvest here in Sunraysia and a lot of workers, seasonal workers and backpackers uh, live in Muldura and travel over to New South Wales to uh, to do that harvest. Um, but initially those, uh, those workers were denied permits to cross over, uh, which essentially um, got harvest, uh, stopped harvest in its tracks. That has been amended, uh, but but the issues haven't stopped there. Uh, health services, uh, people haven't been able to access uh, if they need to go into um, Adelaide. Uh, we've heard from people um, that have needed cancer treatment in Adelaide and have been uh, denied permits um, and have been told that they need to seek treatment uh, seven hours away in Warrnambool, which is a lot further away from the capital city, um, uh, which is only four hours away from Adelaide. We've also heard from um, uh, like I said before earlier, um, Murrayville does, didn't have access to fuel, um, which their fuel station is 25 kilometres in Pinaroo. People had to, uh, there was a farmer who decided to take matters into his own hands and, and actually uh, organised 10,000 litres of petrol and diesel uh, to go onto his farm so people could just access fuel. So, uh, yeah, there's plenty of issues that uh, that have been caused by these uh, restrictions and uh, there is a, definitely some relief in the air that uh, while this won't solve the problems, uh, it has uh, allowed people to live their lives a little bit more easily. OK, we'll leave it there. Alex Trelaw in Mildura in Victoria. More than 360 returned travellers have been moved out of a Sydney hotel after it was deemed unfit for quarantine. Reporter Lily Mayers joins us now from Sydney. Lily, g'day. So take us through what's happened. Good morning, Joe. Well, the 366 travellers were staying here at the Travel Lodge in Sydney City until last night when police announced that they'd reviewed the conditions here and found that they weren't up to scratch. So all of those travellers were transported to other hotels across the city overnight. 
The spokesperson for Travel Lodge has said they weren't aware of any inspections by police or health authorities since July. Uh, they said they also weren't notified of any issues concerning COVID-19 at the, ho- at the hotel, uh, but they respect the decision of authorities. Police haven't said whether the hotel is going to have any penalties imposed on it, just that it's going to be removed from the hotel quarantine roster. We spoke to one traveller, Lauren a farmer who landed from Scotland in uh, Sydney on Friday. She described the conditions here at the hotel as atrocious. She said there were sticky tables, dirty carpets and her bathroom she didn't feel comfortable walking in. Here's a little of what she had to say. You probably, you know, expect that maybe things won't be, you know, obviously as nice as you'd have them at home. But when you're entering into a quarantine facility and you're ready to put yourself through two weeks you know, for the benefit of your country, you would never imagine that you'd show show up in a place that hasn't been properly cleaned. So I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't accept that it was what it was. And Lily, what's the latest with cases in New South Wales? It seems to be the situation that, that, yeah, the numbers are really low every day. I think it was just three yesterday, but persistently we're hearing about little outbreaks popping up here and there. That's right. Case numbers have been pleasingly low for at least the last week and a half. Yesterday, as you said, only three cases. One of those was an overseas traveller in hotel quarantine and the other two were close contacts of previous cases. So authorities were happy with that. They have been consistently saying they're not completely relaxed as there is community transmission still lurking in suburbs, particularly in the west and southwest of Sydney. Today we've also learned there's three Sydney schools which have been closed because of possible cases. That's Riverston High School in the west, Wyndham College in Quakers Hill in the northwest and Schofield's Public School in the southwest of Sydney. So those students who turned up with uh, symptoms have been tested and we're expecting those results to come through later today. There's also been a new alert out for the city Tattersall's fitness centre. The CBD gym will be closed for cleaning today after two people visited while infected. That was a gym member and a contractor. And now anyone who visited the gym on August 19th, 21st or 23rd has been told to be on the lookout for symptoms. Okay, Lily May is reporting there from Sydney. Now, authorities in Queensland are waiting on test results to find out if a coronavirus cluster at the Brisbane Youth Detention Centre in Wacol has spread. So there are 10 cases so far with five staff and five family members testing positive. There are 18 active COVID-19 cases in Queensland and people in the greater Brisbane area have been urged to wear face masks in situations where they can't socially distance. And sticking in Queensland, scientists from the University of Queensland say the initial results from their COVID-19 vaccine trials are promising. Researchers say the preclinical tests using hamsters reveal the treatment triggered the immune system to protect against the disease. The vaccine is also in phase one of human trials. Scientists say there have been no safety concerns with the 120 participants who've been dosed so far. The Prime Minister says he's raised concerns with Daniel Andrews, a Victorian Premier, over his attempts to extend Victoria's state of emergency powers. It comes as the federal government announces its pandemic disaster leave payment will be offered to Tasmanians. Political reporter Jade McMillan joins us now from Canberra. Jade, g'day. So first to Victoria. So the Prime Minister ramped up his criticism of the Premier yesterday. What's he had to say about that this morning? Good morning, Joe. Well, there are a couple of issues here. The first is that there is concern within the federal government about Daniel Andrews' proposal for legislation uh, allowing the government to extend the state of emergency powers in Victoria for another 12 months. The Premier has defended the move, describing it as an insurance measure, uh, but it doesn't look like he's got enough support to get it through the state parliament at this stage. And a number of federal ministers have criticised the plan, saying that that uh, he has not properly explained why this extension is needed. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, says that he's personally spoken to Daniel Andrews about this and he says that he raised concerns about the uncertainty that he says his announcement created, that federal government members have been receiving a lot of calls from Victorians who are worried about what it might mean for them. Uh, Separately to that, though, you've also got uh, the Prime Minister's criticism yesterday of what he said 
has led to Victoria's coronavirus outbreaks in the first place. And Scott Morrison uh, yesterday argued that the testing, tracing and quarantine arrangements in Victoria had been unacceptable. He's not backing away from those comments today, but he has said that it's an exaggeration to suggest that this points to major problems uh, in the relationship between the federal and state governments or indeed the National Cabinet as a whole. We can't ignore what has occurred in Victoria. Of course it's happened. I'm not seeking to get into any blame game here um, at, at all. I mean, I work constructively with the Victorian Premier, but uh, where there are issues that need to be raised, then I, of course, raise them with him, and I've done so consistently, and that's done in the, the spirit of the, the, the partnership that is necessary to work through a crisis. You don't agree on everything, but you certainly discuss everything. And, Jade, what was this pandemic payment announcement this morning? So this is the $1,500 payment that has already been made available to people in Victoria if they need to self-isolate but don't have any sick leave. The Prime Minister has said that it would be open to other states and territories and the Tasmanian Premier has previously flagged that he wanted it uh, to be offered to people in his state. Scott Morrison says an agreement has now been reached uh, with the Tasmanian government so that people there can access that payment in the hope that it will encourage people to stay home if they're sick. Okay, Jade McMillan there in Canberra.